Hey guys, Mark from Periphery here, and in this entry, I'm going to talk a little bit about the bridge riff from the song The Bad Thing. It's a riff that I get asked about a lot from you guys, and uh, I figured I'd talk a little bit about it. It's an acrobatic one. It involves a lot of hammer-ons, pull-offs, um, and open strings, actually. A lot of the things that are in my style naturally, but they're played pretty fast in the context of the rest of the song, so I figured I'd delve into that a little bit. So one of the interesting things about that riff is how acrobatic it is, first of all. There's a lot of sort of playful hammer-ons and pull-offs going on, and the second repetition is also shifted forward a beat, which can confuse the listener and the player. Sometimes it confuses me when I'm playing it. Um, I get a little lost because it starts, I think it's an eighth note after, uh, after the first one is structured. So that begins very slowly with a, uh, a hammer-on lick to begin the, the riff. So the lick begins with a, uh, with a short hammer-on section. So again, slower the... And the most challenging part of the riff is this sort of wacky bit that starts with an open first string and it connects to a three-note pull-off sequence. So that starts with your ring finger on the 11th fret, goes down to the 7th fret, and then pulls off open. And that sounds like... So seamless, I'll try and play it seamless slowly. It's like this. Yeah, and it can be challenging to get up to speed, but again, you just want to make sure you can get it slow before you even attempt to get it fast. The rest of the sequence, at least the first repetition, is finished out by two chords that are not strummed, but picked, have the notes picked individually. And they go like this. Once you play those two chords, the riff recycles, but in a very different context. And this is what I was talking about earlier. That last note, that seventh fret, sustains over the first beat of the next passage. So if you were to play it how the first repetition was played, it should line up perfectly, but it's intentionally shifted back. So I'll play it sort of in context to what I'm talking about. One. If you see what I'm talking about, the one happens and on the offbeat, the phrase starts then. So it's identical to the first repetition, except you're sliding from the 11th to the 14th. And you'll notice, since I'm in this drop A tuning again, power chords are not played like this. Or like this. And you may be wondering why I always do these open chugs as opposed to just playing an octave. I play that because it sounds messier. Uh, because it sort of adds this random unpredictability to what you're hearing and, and, and to the music. There's no real harmonic reason it makes sense to me. It just sort of sounds unbridled and aggressive and I don't know, it's a cool line to walk if you're playing things that are really technical, interjected with these sort of caveman guitar movements, you know. So that continues with this power chord played on the, uh, on the 12th fret. Power chord slash octave, because it's harmonically an octave. And so the ending of that riff goes... <laughs> <laughs> 
And again, another use of, of dissonance on the lower strings to create that unnerving vibe. So the second repetition of the riff repeats note for note in the beginning, but then it shifts to this as the chord section. So the, the third repetition, let's call it, begins. Then the chord changes the second time around. It goes. Sounds more sinister and, and dark compared to the, the, first, the first repetition. And originally we had it to where the chords were the same in both repetition, but this, again, sort of goes in a, in a different territory than what you would expect, which is very appealing to us, so. And then the tail end is the only part that's different about this last repetition that goes. And then there's a guitar solo that happens over that. So another riff that we get asked a lot about in this song is the pre-chorus riff. It involves a very interesting technique where you bend behind the nut, and people see us doing that on stage or at clinics, and it's invariably always one of the first things that people ask about, so I figured I'd break it down for you guys. So the, the time signature behind that riff changes up in the middle of the riff. It starts with one bar of four, it goes to one bar of three, four, and then finishes with two bars of four, four. Um, I guess one of the most interesting aspects about the riff, like I was saying, is the behind the nut bending. And that's, that's a trick that, did Black Sabbath do that? I think Black Sabbath did that a long time ago. And uh, it always sounded, I was like, are they using a whammy bar? But I didn't hear anyone doing it at that time. I don't know if the Floyd Rose even existed back then. But yeah, it's just basically treating it as if you were doing a sort of bending of any string, but obviously there's no frets on the zero fret, as I call it, uh, but sort of bending right here. I use it as a gimmick, and me and the guys use it as a gimmick for just interjecting some sort of different sounding thing. We, spice rack is a term that we use, just adding things that sound interesting to our songs. So another cool aspect of the part, which Misha wrote, is the droning fourth string you have over the entire passage. Uh, it's a term I always bring up because it can add a lot of vibe and energy to a music. So you could easily play the riff with just one note and you could get the same harmonic content, most of it, but there's, there's just something sort of insidious and sinister sounding about the, this note ringing over the same notes. And again, that tail end of it is, you're sliding up to.